Well, good evening. Uh, we are about to start the last session of uh, today, which will be actually the most interesting one uh, because of these excellent speakers. And uh, thank, I, I would like to thank the organizers of this ABS uh, for inviting me here to be the facilitator in this session. And I will be very happy to uh, launch the first questions. Having heard the previous presentations, which were of utmost interest, it is quite clear that we are already used to the idea that a single magical beam software does not exist. In this, it is needless to say, in this forum, but this concept is quite difficult to, uh, for clients to understand. I think this session is very well structured because we are going to talk in three different stages, or uh, we're going to talk about apps in three different stages that relate to a real BIM affecting the whole life cycle of a building. Definitely, we will need new software, new apps, etc. I believe that uh, that the way this session has been structured will illustrate this very, quite nicely. We will begin with our Rhino and Grasshopper. Afterwards, we have the speaker from Controsoft who will be approaching the real industrialization of construction, very important, and how to construct or fabricate our structures in this case. And finally, our last speaker from the company Final Cut will be talking about a very relevant topic uh, for construction works, which are mobile apps to optimize and enhance uh, the construction process on site. So thanks again, and thanks Francesc Saya from the company Visual, uh, Visual Art. He is uh, an architecture and manager and project manager uh, at the company Asun Asuni, among them Visual Art, who is, which is the one he's going to talk about. Well, thank you very much, Oscar, and also to the organizers for allowing me to be here and to share with you Visual Arc. It's a program based on Reno, and I'm sure many of you already are already familiar with it. And also Grasshopper. For those who don't know Reno, Reno is a modeling, a 3D modeling platform that it is useful for other uh, developers to add more apps and functions. This may be apps for architecture, imaging, anything. Basically, Reno is used in very different uh, fields from industrial design, boats, um, jewelry, cars, furniture, animation, shoe wear. So it goes from uh, very small objects such as jewelry up to uh, huge projects such as a building. So here you can see these functionalities of this um, platform that allows you to extract all the documentation regarding a project. It, why BIM? Well, because it comprises all the documentation uh, and all the documents are generated by or based on 3D models. Also, parametrical architecture objects, so we can list them and know the, how many of them are there, the volume, sizes, and so on, and to add new information on each of them. It is more practical to work with these parametrical objects and say, uh, I want it to be three meters long and not four uh, meters long, and this is an improvement. Also, Reno allows for uh, model exchange through the FC ASC format or IFC format. I'm sure you are already familiar with that. So you export that to the IFC and Revit identifies columns and models as native. So the workflow 
is very useful to begin modeling in a very agile way and for compl more complex models in Reno and to translate them uh, to Revit so that other teams can work on them. Why do we talk about flexible beam? Because we work with flexible and complex uh, shapes. With very few control points, we get full um, preci precision. So this is used in uh, construction for modeling, the, for modeling shapes that are later pr uh, 3D printed. And it's also very useful for complex geometries. Flexible also, or well, actually, for the ones not familiar with Grass, Hopper is a visual algorithmical editor. And um, Visual Arc is integrated in Grasshopper. All the objects of Visual Arc can be created from Grasshopper. In this example, you can see a routine, gen a general routine in Grasshopper. And from a solid, you get the height. And it's divided into a number of points. A plan is set into each point and generates an intersection with the original solid. From here, you get the, um, the lines around this uh, object. And this means that, in a very simple way, we can divide a solid object into different levels or uh, stages or floors. And you can create your own tools and routines of this kind of geometry. So the power of Grasshopper is huge when it comes to modeling. I will be showing some live examples for you to get a better impression on that. Another useful function in terms of IFC, on the one hand, we have normal objects such as walls and partitioning, but we can also create solids as this one, which has a more complex shape and at any time, you can assign information and data to that, like make it a forge, for instance. So we can say that this has been a forge. Um, we add a kind of comment or tag. And later on, you can retrieve this information. So this applies not also to objects per se, but also to any kinds of geometry in Reno. Also, it is uh, av available or it has available all CAD uh, or 2D um, tools. And finally, uh, all the tools for architecture, visualization, render renderizations, and photorealistic uh, visualizations. One of uh, Reno applica applications is to uh, elevate these models for 3D printing. And at the end of the day, what you need is a closed surface, a, a, a closed solid, so that the machine reads it as, a, as such. And uh, of course, visual arc objects can be converted. And with a Boolean union, you can convert them through the SLP format, which is the most practical, and bring it to the 3D printer. I would like to show you some of the novelties that we recently launched because I believe them to be really, really handy, especially if you work with Reno and different levels. This gives you the ability to show or hide stages, for instance, and at the same time to work with sections. So you can um, put some certain, you can um, put some sections make some sections active and hide some others and to be more interactive then to uh, draw plans and we have added the function to directly print these plans and sketches so you set uh, for instance a 3d uh, view and you can print this in a good quality I would like to highlight, especially in this new feature related to integration to Grasshopper, that is the ability to create these architecture, architectural objects from Grasshopper. So to translate uh, and transfer this flexibility 
through the dialogues of uh, Visual Arc, for them to be more user friendly and to have a vast library of objects. We continuously add new objects, both in 3D objects and on uh, paper or 2D. And what I said at the beginning, to the possibility to add any kind of information of, uh, to any objects and create new parameters such as the price, the provider or technical transmission coefficient and so on. So anything you want to invent or create, you can just complete these objects with further information. I would like to show you some real cases uh, completed with Reno and Grasshopper, which are at the same time, I have two different, very different platforms. The first one is a project on an existing building in Italy where this building was scanned through a 3D scanner. They obtained uh, the point cloud through a plugin of Reno. And with the visual arc objects, the model was built to get a beam model that uh, would be delivered to the client, which in that case was the town hill of the, of the municipality of this lighthouse. And well, actually, the rest of it comes in automatically. Another example, changing the scale and the, the kind of project, this pavilion in Norway, which shows quite clearly the whole process from uh, the design. Grasshopper is quite uh, widely used in uh, design. Through different values and parameters, you can actually get uh, information of other uh, components, also to draw diagrams uh, to optimize the construction. Here are some views of this pavilion. We apply visual art to get all the, the plans and sketches, some uh, pictures on the uh, construction process and the final. And another example, that's a church in Croatia, which is currently under construction, and that was uh, created completely in Reno and visual art. So we, we were able to work at different heights and stages. So for the architects, bionics, it was extremely useful. They could assign different uh, kinds of partitioning and walls. They worked uh, with the whole, uh, at different levels, as I said, with the corresponding uh, graphical representation. Here we can see some comparisons between the reality and uh, the graphical views. And the last one. Well, if you wish to know further information, you can visit our website or contact me. I have five minutes left. And in this time, during this time, I would like to show you the software and the program live. I know that uh, real, or real time uh, or live demonstrations are quite dangerous, especially because I'm going to show you a beta uh, phase of this software. But I would like you to give uh, a little taste of this, pro of this program. That would, be the, that would be the Reno interface. You see all the objects that Visual Arc adds to Reno and tools, very useful, such as the possibility to work at different levels and stages to a height or add new stages as you wish. And this offers a really interesting view of the project, also very user-friendly. Here I have a door, I can move it around, change it change its location, etc. I double click to change the, the, the floor I want to show. And if I work from, the, from this view, see that it, it seems like a 2D um, representation, but it's not. So this top view actually um, makes our life very easy. There's also a section administrator or manager. So we set the different, define the different regions and sections, and we can uh, change and, and switch from one to the other. And then 
Here we prepare the different uh, floors on paper, and we can choose which floor do we want to show, the ground floor, first floor, etc. The same works and applies uh, to sections, let's say section B or section A or C. We don't have to worry uh, anymore about the 3D in these views. And finally, I would like to show this integration to Grasshopper that we currently develop. So I open Grasshopper. And this garage door, for instance, this door cannot be created by uh, Visual Arc. You have, there's an option which is to assign 3D blocks to certain objects. But this block is a static one. It's not parametrical. In this case, it's a garage door. And if you want to have it, you, can, you have to use Reno or to create uh, some blocks. So what we have done is to develop the possibility to create it on Grasshopper. Here we um, set the width and the height, the opening. So that would be the input values. And finally, we have two geographical components, the leaves and the frame. I save, click on save, this definition. And now I create a new door style. Here you can see that there's a conventional door and the option to create this door from Grasshopper. So I select the file that I just saved. Actually, this geometry is created by Grasshopper from behind, even though we don't see it, and the geo geometrical components that we included in the definition. Here, there's a list of all the parameters that define uh, this object, and to each of them, we can uh, choose if they are edible by definition, style, uh, or object, or just hide them because some of them are just uh, figure related and, and not interesting uh, to any particular case. So once we have this object, or once we complete this process, this object is at our disposal and therefore we can just include it in our model. We can take a look at its properties and we'll see that the properties are the same that we this, that we define for the op for the object and we can modify it if we wish so this provides us with full flexibility to create any objects that we want in a freely manner and with no design constraints so I have no more time left. Thank you very much for your attention, and thank you very much. Well, uh, you were perfectly on time. And since we are changing um, laptops, I didn't, uh, I'm going to introduce myself because I didn't want to use the time of our speakers. Uh, my name is Oscar Liebana. I'm an architectural director and civil engineer at the university, European University in Madrid. So I have a rather academic profile. And I also uh, belong to the uh, a virtual association of uh, trainers and educators uh, that work with BEAM. I believe that uh, these applications and software, software are needed in order to avoid that BEAM is associated to construction only. And I think that this kind of tools, such as Reno and Grasshopper, and so reflect what should happen in reality, that BIM is applied in the design phase, but also to the construction. I think the mindset in universities is starting to change and to swift. And I think that for students, it is much easier to use several uh, softwares and plugins and so on. So it's not actually a problem for them. Okay, I'm going to keep myself short. Well, actually, being myself a lecturer for structures, uh, this the next um, 
presentation uh, is the topic I am very familiar with. Uh, Jose Coscuyela Coscuyel is an engineer in construction and also a partner of the ConstruSoft group. He's been uh, working for many, many years in this sector. He worked um, in, in, he was in Stanford, and I think that he contributed to this a change in the mindset, which is the reality of uh, structures in building in concrete on site. Thank you very much, Oscar. Well, I feel like at home here, I am actually from Barcelona, and in Chile it's really cold right now, that's where I live, so I feel really well. Uh, in Barcelona. Thank you for being here, for choosing our uh, talk. And I wanted to ask you something. How many of you work in a construction company directly? You can raise up your hands. And as subcontractors, how many of you are uh, subcontractors of a construction company? Okay. ConstruSoft. Um, well, you can say we didn't really put much effort in the in the name of the company, but the, the 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 company, the equipment is really good. The team is even better, and many of you know Construsoft by Tecla. Um, we have always been uh, related to the structure uh, sector. There are three parts. We have been working with BIM from 1995, even before that the actual BIM denomination was uh, created. We work with models such as Tecla, the part of uh, managing structures that's Tecla, the part that deals with 4D and 5D is Bico, and then we have also added another software in our portfolio for uh, industrial plants, that's Catmatic. Okay. We have uh, six six things I would like to talk with you about. Do you think that BIM and productivity go together? Is it the same? If I work with BIM, I'm more productive? We'll talk about it later. We will also uh, analyze a very simple uh, work site. The following question is who must perform the model and most importantly, who must pay for it? In, we, we have uh, offices in Lima, Bogota, Santiago de Chile, Barcelona, Madrid, and many clients, many clients say, well, we are not paid for this, who should do that? And many times we don't really talk about the model, who should pay for the model. We will also talk about, um, uh, Oscar actually mentioned, I got a certification from Stanford in VDC, and Martin Fisher, who was a professor of mine in Stanford, will be here tomorrow. You cannot miss his presentation. So we will talk about how we work with virtual design construction. Also, we will talk about information for the construction company, and we will also cover some uh, already performed experiences in America. So let's cut the chase. Uh, BIM and productivity. The Chilean government uh, actually carried out an analysis and we see the blue horizontal line. We see that productivity does not really grow, but other sectors uh, are growing. So why we do not have more uh, productivity in construction, but they do have more productivity in other sectors. Then they compared uh, to the states, to the United States, in 2007, we assumed that if the United States had 100 units, Chile had 55. We checked again in 2011, and we went from 55 to 48. And they wondered, why is this happening? The conclusion is, is that we need to prefabricate, and also they concluded that if information is segmented and fragmented, it does not work. So if you use any platform, the most, like the coolest uh, 3D system, but you end up working with paper, you will have the same productivity as 50 years ago. Maybe, yes, you'll get better products, but the productivity will be pretty much the same. So if we use paper in any of the stages, we are back to the same productivity as 50 years ago. We are part of a, of a task group for the government, and we need to go from the image on the left to the image on the right. 
Let's focus now in a very complicated and complex project. Think about it. Okay, there we go. This is a home center such as uh, the IKEA furniture. I put that together with my mother-in-law. We got along really well, so it was not really a risky project. But, you know, after we finished, I needed to have uh, exploded drawing and also mounting instructions. Without the instructions, maybe we wouldn't have been able to do that. So imagine, if we need all the instructions very detailed for such a small thing, don't you think I will need the same for a hospital, for building a hospital, an airport, or for building anything? And the answer is yes. Do we have it? The answer is no. So basically, we are reaching a compatibilization model we have a clash detection system, that's great. But it's like if we only had the 3D model for the furniture we put together. We also need the bolts and we need the, the uh, mounting instructions. We think that uh, the traditional beam is cool, the platforms that are doing that are great, but we need to move further. We need to go beyond that, we need to have more detail maybe we can reach up to the level 400, 450, so that we have all the information and it goes from the model to the machine. Then we will change our productivity when compared to paper. So I would like to have the eye of BIM, not only for information, but also for industrialization. That's the workflow. Tomorrow we'll hear about similar things, but when we talk about the 300 level, we are doing the traditional beam. As I was saying, we think that this is what we need to achieve, this part on screen, where the subcontractor works at a very detailed level that allows us to bring the fabricated piece with a code bar so that we can just put that in the right place and we will be very more productive. So we will have all the uh, embeds, all the installations, all the MEP, all the reinforcing steel, or the anchors, all the rebars. If we have all this information, we do not only have the information from the beginning, but we have all the information we need to plan uh, the work the best way. Also, in the United States, they have the beam to fill that gives us some layout points to check points to check if the beam is well uh, used or not for many years our softwares have dealt with uh, this structure but for any specialty we need to do the same we need to achieve a constructible model and hopefully also an industrializable one from the model we are able to reach to the point where we can uh, build the different components. A person can do 50 of these pieces a day, but the machine does several per second. For example, we can also have uh, other clients in the steel industry. In this industry, each uh, machine is connected with Tecla, and then when we start working with the machine, we see that the machine knows already what needs to be done. And it's very precise. It's almost uh, playing with, with Lego. Also, when we work with uh, prefabricated concrete, uh, it works as well. In the past, we work with paper, but now we are working with different prefabricated uh, elements. So we listen to the diagnosis that has been done in several countries so that we have a larger productivity. Here, for example, we know where the piece goes. We just put it together, we mount it together, and that's perfect. The on-site work can last months, but the prefabricated work can just last, last some days. So who pays for these? If we industrialize, we're more productive. 
and it will work out fine. But who pays for that and who carries out all the work? We have three possibilities, the uh, engineering company, the provider or the subcontractor. Sometimes we have the engineering company and they do very high quality projects and we're done. But what happens is that many times the engineering companies say that they are not paid for that, so they don't want to do it. The construction company needs to have information to work faster, and also the industrial needs to have information to work faster. So who pays for it? Some countries, like the United States, um, the situation is that the contractor pays for it uh, willingly. But in our country, for example, in Spain, we don't do it this way. You know, maybe we have the money to do the clash check, but that's pretty much it. So with construction companies, we see that 75% of the money goes to subcontractors. And it would make sense to say, I will pay you as much money, but I don't only want the project. I want the model, and I want to be well performed, and I want to show how your, pro how your product was done. And that model will be useful for me to create other projects. In the, proje in the countries where this is done, this works great. So we think that it could be a good idea that the subcontractor does this work, not as an additional uh, service, but just as a uh, added value. Do you think that could work? After that, the construction company gets uh, many advantages because they have all the value. This is what they do is not a model different from what was done at the beginning. It's a very well performed model. Afterwards, I can do a really good planning. And just by using code bars, I will know where each piece goes. I will also be able to plan. I will know what is needed every day on site. And I can also do that with a 4D tool. I can also plan when I will have the concrete trucks coming. And I will know where the reinforced uh, concrete must go. The rebar is, is also important. I'm running out of time, and I still have a lot to say. So with the rebar, if I know where each rebar goes, I will not lose any part. So what we do, the idea is that we need to have everything really well defined, so I can just put the pieces together like when we play with Lego. Uh, with pouring, well, we see that here I can determine what uh, I'm going to, to pour every day. Also with three bars. Instead of having papers that really do not give me much information on uh, where each element goes, these uh, rivers will show me a lot of information, and we are saving a lot of money. For example, here we have the production workflow from the modeling up until the uh, just-in-time delivery of the material we need with the quality we need, and at the moment we need it. So, based on the Stanford system, we start with a clash uh, detection, we do the modeling, and we will have all the specialties. We need to make sure that everything is working out fine. Once we are there, we need to make it compatible. We will have the RFI. And just a little piece of advice. We are working in 15, 16 projects right now as consultants, so we need to have the industrial company come and talk to you. We need to have all the different stakeholders and they need to talk and make decisions about some clashes that will cost a lot of money. And then we need to decide how everything needs to be produced and who will be better. That means more productivity. And remember, we're not talking about drawings, actually. Tomorrow, Martin will talk about uh, some very collaborative meetings, everyone there saying their own opinion about the workflow. And industrializable, industrializable uh, material. This way, we will have all the different elements so that we can order the material the way that works better for us. Let's forget about paper. Let's have also the industrial company that will bring 
their components and they bring it to us so that we can put each piece together when we want to use it. The model needs to get on site, otherwise it's useless. Can I get a couple more minutes? Okay. So we're not talking, talking only about structure. I also want to show you how the MEP and all the prefabricated stages help us here. This is what our clients do. This is what the construction company must demand to the subcontractors. This is the way you need to work and that you will hear about tomorrow. As uh, associated information to the model, we will t make some decisions on construction, but we also need, let's see this uh, Excel sheet, let's zoom in, but you will see that I have marked uh, two columns in yellow. That's where the dates of when each uh, stage is completed. And at the same time, we also need to know about the logistics. We need to get information about the model on site and real. So we need to go to the actual on site with the model. And finally, I will say this is a cross cutting process. Well, you will see this is not the piece of furniture we were doing, but we can use it to um, different uses. This is an office building. Um, this is an ongoing construction work that we are doing in Lima. This is by a head cliff. And we're building this hotel starting from the model. We're working from the model. We also have a nuclear plant in France. So this is a cross-cutting process and project. This is also part of the uh, Santiago airport. And the idea is to have real coordination, coordination among specialties. And someone needs to do the model so that the construction company can take it to the uh, work site. You are invited to check more on this in our stand outside the room. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. And finally, last but not least, and you know that to close to close the loop, um, we've talked about industrialization, and of course, industrialization will have an important role for in our next session or speech, because uh, we are going to talk about the apps and other features that people will uh, ha will need on site. So I'm going to introduce Aurelian Blaha, who's the marketing director of Final Cut, who's going to talk mostly on um, mobile devices. I'll to speak here. Thank you. Thanks especially to Ignacy. And thank you, everyone, for being here for the last session of the day. I promise I, I will be uh, short. Um, so our topic uh, today is how to bring BIM to the field, to people on the field, to everyone involved during the construction on the construction site. Uh, I'm Aurélien Barra, I'm marketing director with Final Cad. Our mission is to change the way we build with mobile apps for anyone involved in the field, including contractors, subcontractors, architects, and developers. If you think about it, we all have mobile apps today in our pockets, on smartphones, on tablets. Uh, we all use apps like Airbnb, Uber, Waze, such as this one. And the success of those apps is really massive. Why? Because there's massive adoption. All of us are using them. Why is there massive adoption? Because they are very well designed. They're very easy to use. With something like Waze, you just enter an address, and it will tell you at what time you will arrive. Now, imagine you have a mobile app where you put your BIM model on it, and it will tell you when you will deliver the building. Wouldn't that be great, right? The problem with professional apps is that they are not as well designed and as user-friendly as the apps we use at home. Why is so? Why, why at work we shouldn't have the ability to have such beautifully designed apps as we have at home, right? So the whole question is how to bring BIM onto the field 
for anyone to use. If we don't want to have this digital divide between engineers and architects that are using BIM in the office for the design phase, and people on the field who actually build the building or the infrastructure, why shouldn't be, we should it be out of this uh, digital transformation? But of course, BIM is complex, and bringing BIM to the field is not easy. So what I want to share with you today is a few rules that we've applied to ourselves to make sure that BIM can be used by anyone, and in a way that is so simple and can be used by anyone. So the whole question is how to bring this virtual model that has been designed to the field. Why is it interesting? Because to uh, uh, avoid this digital divide between the design and the construction, you might have a beautiful design in, the, in the, uh, the BIM model in the design phase. If you go back to paper blueprints in the construction phase, it's almost you know, everything lost. And then there's another divide between the construction phase and the facility management when there is no data uh, of the asset. There's no history. The contractor, his only thing that he thinks about is his next project. And the facility manager has to find out where here is leaking, here is breaking, and there's no traceability, there's no history. So taking the advantage, the opportunity of the construction phase, which is in the middle, to track the changes is very key to have a consistent virtual twin, digital twin, if you prefer, uh, all along the stages. So rule number one is we focus on the job. There's a lot of uh, applications on the market for BIM uh, on tablets or smartphones. The problem is that they bring the whole model. So it's great for architects because the architect knows his own baby, he knows how to play with the project and everything, but for people on the field, this is way too complicated. So what we do is we pre-filter, we pre-select elements of interest for a given phase, for a given stakeholder at a given time. So for instance, here for structural work, let's assume we have to do quality control on those pillars. We will select the pillars one by one for them to be able to do the quality control with the why questions like, is it uh, compliant, uh, is imp the implementation has been respected, the dimensions are okay, the material is okay, and so on. So the way we do that, we've developed plugins on, on Revit that will ultimately select all the objects and create the associated quality control or progress monitoring processes that can be used directly on the mobile app and then that can generate data analytics and reports. Rule number two is to use metaphors. Um, if we look at the way people are using paper blueprints today, um, a, a common way is to, to follow the progress. It's to use you know, those Stabilo bus pens with red when it's not compliant, or green when it's done, or yellow when it's in progress. We did the same thing on the BIM model. So on the BIM model, you can follow the quality control, or you can follow the progress uh, using the same metaphor I've, as a Stabilo on the blueprint, here except that it's on the BIM model directly, and of course you can uh, generate uh, reports in the same way. And of course, all of this is sent back to the BIM model back to the office where the BIM manager can follow over time and reconcile as built with as designed. Rule number three is to try every time we, we, we can to make it really, really simple. So I'll show you three examples. The first one is uh, we've been using QR codes because in most buildings, especially housing or here it's a hospital, all the rooms or all the housing units are looking like, um, like each other. So it's really a pain to get sorted where, where you are. So here you just flash the QR code and boom, you're instantly brought to the right uh, blueprint or the right model. Another one we developed is we got inspiration from what you have on your smartphone when you take pictures of people, it automatically recognizes the face of people. We did this, we used the same algorithm, this deep learning algorithm, to recognize objects of a building. 
The advantage is that it will do predictive analytics on what is the most frequent corrective action associated to that object. So for instance, here with a, a security uh, block, it would be probably replace or, or change or uh, fix it. So you have like, you type in Google suggest, you have suggestions and shows uh, uh, what are the most corrective actions. So really simplifying the work. And the last example is instead of having the defects on a blueprint or a BIM model, uh, we developed uh, with um, Google Tango technology, which is an infrared technology, and, and Flux, Flux.io. We developed um, an app where you can directly see with augmented reality and put the defects that you are spotting directly within the app. So from there, I mean, you don't even need to know how to read a drawing or a BIM model. You just point where the defects are. So it's, it's quite, uh, it's really, I, I, don't think, I don't see what we could do more simple than that. So really bringing, and of course, this goes back to the BIM model. So really make sure that this is as easy to use as it can be. Um, now, the thing is, in theory, BIM is about design, construction phase, and facility management. The truth is that as of today, BIM is still most of the time stuck in the design phase. It struggles to go down to the construction phase and then, and then forward. Um, but this is changing. Uh, we, we did a survey uh, between March 2016 and March 2017, and we found that actually that the adoption is coming. Uh, we asked people uh, from especially contractors and subcontractors, are you using BIM during the construction phase? And you can see that the trend is moving up um, in terms of adoption, and of course the people uh, who are not using it uh, is going down. So it's really happening now. Um, so uh, are you ready to, to put boots on BIM? And as, as we say, we use ways to drive today, and tomorrow we'll use Final CAD to build. Thank you very much. Oh, one, one last thing. Uh, we're looking for Spanish partners. <laughs> so if anyone in the room is interested to help us <laughs> in Spain, uh, much welcome. Thank you. Ya sabéis, si alguien quiere ser socio. Bueno, muchas gracias. Well, thank you very much for this presentation. That will be the last one. And we are going to close this final session. If the audience has any question, uh, we have about five minutes left. Otherwise, I am going to ask something. Well, a general question for the three speakers. What do you think, since we have uh, talked about software, different stages and phases, and also the life cycle of a building. What do you think about interoperability among them and the use of I, uh, IFC? And how do you think that this typical problem is currently shifting, the problem we have from the designers up to the construction? So the floor is yours. Well, in our case, many users use IFC to model in Reno, and then they need the IFC model for other software. I would say the IFC is the one providing them uh, the large number of solutions, but it's not 100% uh, useful. So it has still some constraints and limitations because Every client uses different parameters, and sometimes this communication is not full. IFC is really necessary, and also it's very good. Perfect, no. Very good, yes. Uh, we have uh, actually answered about 45,000 questions uh, regarding technical support, and many of them are related to the IFC. And 
I wonder myself if they have actually uh, taken a look at the specificities of IFC. Uh, you have to take some look, some time and, and take a deeper look of that. In the airport of uh, Santiago de uh, the Chile, um, there have been some small areas and logical pieces such as the pilots and the slabs and to see if the areas are well or not. Maybe we are about 10% wrong, but I think that the IFC is good and necessary. And it also ensures that if a software developer disappears, IFC is going to be there always. And also, if you allow me to give you uh, some piece of advice, take courses on multi-platforms, which means courses not based in, just in one platform, but different platforms. If so, you will have we, we, you, you won't be fearing anything. And as I said, IFC works quite well, not perfectly, but quite well. <laughs> Do you know what? I don't know in mobile apps. Yes, you know? yes, of course. Yeah, I mentioned, I mentioned Revit because, uh, um, I mean, we, we are, we're a small organization, so we go on the opportunity line, right? So <laughs> Revit is... Uh, by far, the, we get 80% of the projects with Revit, so that's why we, we, we chose to integrate directly with Revit. Anything outside, we use, of course, IFC. Uh, yeah. So the level of detail that we get in the end is a bit lower, of course. Uh, but of course, we, we can use IFC uh, to get uh, the model on the tablet. And then for the way back to the model, we use the BCF, the Beam Collaboration Format, which is um, the, the metaphor is often the sticky notes on the objects. Uh, which is very lightweight and very suited to the kind of information we get on the ground, such as pictures, comments, dates, and then we get this back up to the BIM model back in the office, and then the BIM manager has the opportunity to um, uh, change the model according to what has been built. Muy bien. Muchas gracias. Well, thank you very much. I don't know if there's any question left or want to say something else about IFC. Uh, Building Smart recommended us to talk about this, but I think that IFC is more and more relevant regarding the use of software and apps. So thank you very much to all of you and see you tomorrow.